And um, I welcome on stage Deepanka Gupta, Manvendra Singh, Lili Wangchuk, who is a little bit late, and they will be in conversation with Mukulika Banerjee. Please come on stage. Um, Mukulika Banerjee is Associate Professor in Social Anthropology at the London S School of Economics and the first director of the South, A South Asia Center to be launched at LSE in January 2014. A big hand to our panel and a hand over to Mak Mukulika. Thank you. Welcome everybody and, and apologies for the slight delay, but we're waiting for one of our panelists to arrive. She's on her way from the hotel, but as you're all here, we thought we'd start and we'll take a little pause when she comes. Uh, I'm Mukulika Banerjee and it gives me great pleasure to be here at Jaipur and to be uh, with this wonderful audience, and to invite two very distinguished and very interesting commentators uh, of contemporary India. Professor Dipankar Gupta on my immediate left is a um, distinguished professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University and emeritus professor at Shivnagar University. who's written extensively on various aspects of Indian society. We'll be discussing, today's session is entitled Citizen Elites, which is the title of his new book on sale. Uh, and uh, we'll widen the discussion, taking his argument forward. On cue is Lili Wangchuk, all the way from Bhutan. Um, who has been a political representative in her own country, a diplomat uh, for, and recognized for distinguished service to the diplomatic corps, um, and uh, an active member in various aspects of Bhutanese society. And finally, the son of the soil on my extreme left, Manvendra Singh, uh, recently re-elected and into as MLA from uh, the assembly constituency of Shiv. Of course, many of you here will know uh, and were colleagues with him in his earlier avatar yeah. as a journalist at Indian Express. So here's a politician who can also write and, and is articulate, and we welcome them all uh, to this panel. Now, what I thought we'd start by doing is uh, just look at this term, citizen elite, which uh, Dipankar has used as the title of his book. And it clearly signals, and, and um, Dipankar very clearly lays out in the book, uh, that this category of citizen elite, of which there are examples, uh, is a category of people, of individuals, who are not like the political elite or the economic elite, not the business elite. Uh, but they are people who are willing to forsake their own interests for a much larger common good. Now, can I start by asking you, Dipankar, why did you feel there was the need to coin this category of citizen elite? Well, uh, I was, of course, impressed, most of all, by T.H. Marshall and his definition of citizenship, where he said that citizenship confers an equality of status upon which structures of inequality may be built. But the equality of status was very important at start. And I felt that in our country, we were not working on that energetically enough. We were thinking in terms of needs for the poor or shops for the poor or whatever. But to create citizens, you had to make people the country equal at a very basic and fundamental level. And that uh, demands universal health and universal education and urban policies, which affect everybody universally. Now, these things don't come easy because all of this demands fraternity. And as we were discussing in the morning, fraternity is actually a very difficult thing to do. 
democracy in general is very difficult. It's not an easy task at all. It's a very difficult arrangement, probably the most contrived social arrangement in history. Uh, monarchy is easy, fascism is easy, casteism is easy, but democracy is very difficult. It's difficult simply because democracy centralizes fraternity. And when democracy began its career over 100 years ago, no one really thought what kind of potentialities it held, what riches it concealed. But there were citizen elite from time to time who excavated democracy and pulled out from within it uh, so many of its riches which we now take for granted. For example, universal franchise, rights of women, minorities, uh, you know, abolition of child labor, things that we now take for granted uh, didn't happen naturally to the citizen elite people who went against the tide and forced these issues on the population and eventually won them over. In our country, we have a few examples as well. But when you say that uh, they went against the tide, are you then suggesting that almost by definition there's an anti-democratic sentiment in that initial vision which is not created through consultation of the masses? Well, yes, in a way you might say so, but I think that would be a little unfair because think of Mahatma Gandhi. I think he was a citizen elite and he went against the tide. Because had Mahatma Gandhi gone around with the paper and pen like most of us do when we do research, asking people, what do you want? I don't think people would have said that we want to fight against untouchability. Gandhi went against the tide and said, I don't like untouchability. And why don't I like it? Because it goes against the tenets of citizenship. I think that is the most important thing. When Jawaharlal Nehru fought against this or advocated the Hindu Marriage Act, he didn't ask Hindu men whether they want to remain polygamous or not. It was just not right in terms of citizenship. Because citizenship, remember, confers an equality of status. So you and I should be able to trade places. And this is something that Gandhi saw, Nehru saw, and indeed many of the champions of democracy saw over the last 150 years, which is why we are here. Now, if they were consulting the people all the time and responding to givens, responding to what people want in a gross fashion, then there's no point in having democracy. As I, as I mentioned this, in this book, Democracy doesn't really, is not really a mirror that you hold up. A uh, true democrat is a person who has a hammer to shape reality and not a mirror to reflect reality. Because reality really is not worth reflecting. Unless you can change that reality, what good is democracy? The thing about somebody like Gandhi is, as, as you point out yourself, is that of course the choice of untouchability or the Hindu Marriage Act even though they came from within him and there were political choices he made, they resonated with a vast part of the population. So it is, yes, it is a sentiment that grew out of him without consultation, but there is enough contact and awareness of what the real issues are uh, such that it resonates. So the idea has to be the right one, right? It can't be any old idea that you... No, it can't be any old idea because remember, uh, citizen elite is not just a elite, as you mentioned. And nor is the citizen elite a, di a dictator. The citizen elite submits herself or himself to a popular mandate. So if you don't like what I'm offering, you, you can throw me out. But first and foremost, I must be the person to take the risk. And the risk really is not very much if you're paying attention to citizenship and to what people are saying and to be able to mold all of that and come up with a new formulation altogether. And this, is, this has happened throughout history. I mean, you, you wouldn't have moved beyond the first stage of Magna Carta if they weren't the citizen elite who at every point in history, the important junctures in history, proved to be you know, really masters of the situation and turn things around. Mm. Those inflection points are very important points in historical narratives. OK. Can I turn to you, uh, Lily? You have said in interviews and, and, and expressed your enthusiasm for electoral demo democracy in Bhutan. And you recently had elections. Now, with this argument, you know, with this idea of citizen elites who are not just elected leaders, how do you see elections creating new citizen elites? Or do you think there is a contradiction there in your country? Um, well, in Bhutan, uh, the, first of all, I'm humbled that I'm one of the few Bhutanese to be participating in the literary festival. Uh, my apologies, I walked in late. I just flew in from Bhutan and I came straight from the airport. Um, going back to your question, uh, I think for Bhutan, democracy being a very uh, new experience for us, there's been a lot of uh, effort made by His Majesty in encouraging people to participate in the political process. 
and uh, I think uh, we, in recent years we have seen a lot of educated people assuming the role of a citizen elite, almost uh, in giving up uh, their own personal comfort and uh, professional uh, uh, background in uh, participating in the political process. And I think these are people who has the potential of being able to make a difference as a citizen elite. I don't know if I answered. I mean, given we don't actually, even though you're our close neighbor, I'm sure most of us in this audience are not aware. Would you like to tell us if you had to, like Dipankar, list the four priorities in Bhutan, uh, what would you say they should be for a vision of the future of Bhutan? Um, I think uh, given the fact that uh, we have uh, a, a very small uh, population that's, uh, you know, uh, literate, uh, I think uh, uh, the educated lot has, the, I think, uh, the responsibility to really uh, be able to make a positive difference. And uh, because of my own brush through political experience, uh, I see uh, politics as the best platform in where you could really make a difference, where citizen elites could really make a difference in the bringing about policy change. Mm. Okay. Manvendra, you're at the cold face of, of these issues. Mm -hmm. So the bankers listed these um, four urgent issues of universal health, universal education, the formalization of the labor force, and a strict policy of urbanization. How do you see these challenges, say, in your own constituency? Well, I think the urbanization uh, process is not relevant in my constituency uh, because it's a 100% rural constituency. So I put that aside. Uh, but universal health uh, is the most important. Uh, you know, one of the uh, scandals in India is the incredibly high rate for infant mortality and maternal mortality. And in, our, in all our statistics, uh, you know, you, you, if you look deep, you find it there. But it's, just, it's something that we are not addressing, uh, even in the most urgent sense. And uh, for me, that's more important than education, actually. Um, you know, there are people doing education, the private sector, sector is doing its bit, uh, the state is doing its bit. But when it comes to infant and maternal mortality figures, um, it, and I'm not talking just in terms of my constituency, but it's across the country. Mm. Um, and you know, we, we very lost sight of this crisis, and it affects far too many people to be, you know, brushed aside or or not paid great attention to. Mm. I mean, Deepakar's book is called Revolution from Above. Yeah. I mean, would you argue that? I mean, you really fall into the category of who you would define as the political elite, right? So you're. Uh, you come from a political family, you belong to one of the uh, big national parties, you, um, you've been elected into power, so you are part of the political class that is able to make decisions. But with these, you know, and we heard from Professor Sen this morning, and these issues of health and education, which are absolutely fundamental um, and urgent, is this in fact a deficit where you require a, a larger vision that is beyond electoral promises? And can that come from elected representatives or would you look to a, a different kind of figure to provide that vision? No, I think it can come, come from elected representatives and I think it should come from elected representatives. Uh, I think the solution to the problem lies uh, in greater participation in the electoral process. I got a lot of stick in Parliament uh, in one of the dis discussions where I said that uh, everybody contesting elections are getting elected to uh, any assembly um, should have had a job first, um, should be employable. Um, and I got stick because I was told that it's a, that's a very elitist thing to say. And I said, you know, somebody could be breaking stones in a quarry and that would qualify as a job for me. But I think politics in India particularly are more uh, familiar with this, obviously. I think politics in India requires uh, a, a greater sense of discipline uh, in terms of work discipline. I'm not talking in terms of discipline in terms of campaign and, and organizing election rallies or all that sort of, but I think just work discipline 
and, and work uh, is where these arguments or these issues come in. And uh, how, why, why it's not happening? I think when it happened in the last 60 years, 65 years, where our, our, our electoral politics have, have, has taken us. Um, and I think with greater participation of uh, obviously educated people, but somebody who brings in, uh, you know, a, a different experience to politics. Uh, my experience in life has been as a journalist, and I, I bring that into politics. Somebody brings in, you know, years of medical service in a rural health program. Somebody comes as an academic. Somebody comes in any field. But I think more that we get, or oh, you know, some banker. Uh, you know, it'd be good to get people like that getting into electoral politics and struggling and, and making their way up uh, to whatever degree. But um, that would change the nature of the Indian delivery system. We have uh, underperforming uh, politicians because the dependence is on the bureaucracy to deliver. And the bureaucracy cannot deliver without strict, clear political direction. And uh, that can only come when the person taking the executive decision has more knowledge, wisdom, and, um, and the gumption than the bureaucrat. It's interesting when we talk about issues of governance, you talk to the business class, they'll say the problem is with the political leaders and the bureaucracy. You talk to the bureaucrats, they'll say the problem is with the political class and, and business. And you talk to politicians and they'll say the problem is with the bureaucracy. What sense of citizenship do you think, for instance, the bureaucracy has? Well, if you talk to academics, they so say the problem is everybody else <laughs> but us. Um, you know, uh, our four founders of this country gave us freedom, gave us independence, and they opened the door. Now, it's about time we got out of the door and gave ourselves citizenship. Uh, freedom does not always mean citizenship. There are many independent countries which, where citizenship really doesn't apply in the same way as it should. And very often I think that politicians, some politicians, uh, are in a, a kind of a vantage, holding a vantage point. They can make a difference. But the thing is that very often they get uh, either overwhelmed by circumstances or by the need to win the next election or to think in terms of where to get the votes from. If democracy were only about votes, you know, I'm not interested at all. If they got democracies about votes and the tuning of votes with utopian visions, it is these two things when they get together that makes dem democracy electric. Without a utopia, without a vision, there's no point in asking for votes. Because then what are you doing? You're just flogging the given, the same situation again and again with minor increments. When we talk, for example, in terms of health and education in our country, we don't really talk about universal health and universal education because we say we don't have the money. Yeah. And I keep arguing that all over the world, wherever health and education were made universal, did not happen when those countries had the money. In fact, when those countries were very poor, that's when they started universal health and universal education, and they became rich and middle class on account of that. But in India, every time you think of a big plan, a utopian vision, someone will stand up and say, but where is the money? And health, therefore we have health for the poor, or education for the poor, which always ends up in poor health and poor education. I mean, one of the examples in your book is of Basque country in, in Spain, and uh, there is a, it's a small region which rather than after the civil war in Spain, rather than feeling held back by the, by the legacy of the civil war, in fact takes it on as a political experiment, mm -hmm. right? And uh, forges in a period of just 20, 30 years, a remarkable... It's remarkable change, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? And yes. I want to see yeah. then if Bhutan can yeah. be well, a suitable example. be a bust, really. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was discussing, I was sort of jaywalking through history, and I said, it suddenly struck me that all these major changes in democracy happened because people made the effort to make that change and went against the tide. And I was talking to the then uh, Spanish ambassador, and he said that you shouldn't feel too sorry for yourself having missed out th those occasions. You can go to the Basque country now, and people out there are really making it happen today. So my wife and I, we went to the Basque country, and we were just so surprised and impressed we were talking to the people who made a difference. Basque country was the most backward part of Spain and of Europe. It was a basket case, really. 
And today it's, a, it's a sh one of the shiniest parts of Europe. It's uh, all the human development indices we talk about, health, education, doctors per patient, hospital beds per patient, innovation, leader in wind energy, solar energy, one of some of the best producers of steel, all that's happening in Basque in 20 years. So I asked the leader of Basque country, how did you do it? Did you talk to the people? They said, no, we had a vision, we did it, and then we asked the people, are we right? And they said, yes, go on. And that's how it happened. You mentioned bankers, didn't you? One of the most important leaders of the Basque movement after Franco died and that Basque became a, a democratic country was a banker who was one of the leaders of the second largest bank in the world. And he said he gave up everything, his job. He took a huge cut in his salary, obviously. But what is more, he took a massive political and economic risk. And unless you take those risks, you can never make democracy happen. You can't do democracy by, you know, playing safe. Mm. Do you think Bhutan could be that kind of social and political experiment? I mean, the scale is small. Um, that you can, can you drive through reforms uh, which come out of a vision? Um, I think in Bhutan, uh, most of the reforms, in fact, the positive transformation that we have changed, uh, I think our fourth king has a lot to do with that. Uh, 30 years ago, you talk about a country that was completely isolated, underdeveloped, and well, probably the poorest country in the region. But today, we are very progressive, uh, a country that's on part of cross-national happiness, and a country that has probably the highest GDP per capita in the region. And I think all that was, I think, because of the vision and uh, the, contribu the selfless uh, contribution made by our fourth king who at the peak of his popularity, uh, in fact, uh, uh, gave up his own power to introduce democracy in the country. So democracy in Bhutan, as most of you all may be aware, has been a top-down initiative where people have not asked for democracy. There was no bloodshed, there was no revolution, but rather it has been a top-down initiative where our king felt that in the interest of the nation, uh, you know, no person for that matter, not even the king of Bhutan should be indispensable. And uh, the power needs to be passed on to the people so that the people can have self-governance. So the, despite a lot of resistance from the people, because people were very comfortable with the sort of system of governance that we've had, because over the last few decades, we have only seen rapid, remarkable progress and economic growth. So people had no complaints about it, and uh, people were not open for change. But our king felt that uh, in keeping with the changing environment and in keeping with longer term interests, uh, change has to happen. And change in Bhutan was introduced by his majesty. And uh, going even further than that, he even came with the concept of cross-national happiness, uh, yeah. which has, I think, uh, gained us increasing uh, you know, appreciation the, the, from the global uh, community of Absolutely. nations. Yeah. So uh, I would say His Majesty the Fourth King in Bhutan is a typical example of a citizen elite. Mm. From what you're saying, that absolutely <laughs> sounds the case. In fact, um, Mandanya, would you say that when you are the MLA or MP of an assembly constituency or a parliamentary constituency, you can, if you have a vision for, say, healthcare, is it possible to put this in place, because again, there is no issue of consultation, you know people want it. But what are the limitations to making it happen? Why doesn't it happen? Surely somebody like you, I can imagine, would see it as an obvious need. Why can't you make it happen? What are the limitations? Well, the, uh, you know, when people elect you, um, they, they expect you to have a vision, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that fits into what uh, Professor Gu uh, Gupta's book is really about. People expect a vision. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they expect to be led. Mm -hmm. They expect to be led socially. They expect to be led politically. Unfortunately, we tend to focus on the politics part of the leadership. And we've lost track of the social part of the leadership or the responsibility of leadership. Yeah. Uh, the examples that you gave over Gandhiji and Nehru, those are, those are social aspects uh, or, or aspects of social leadership they provided. But I think uh, society and uh, the... Uh, India was different then. I think India is a lot different now than what it was then. Coming to your question about what are the hurdles, you know, it's complete rubbish that money is a problem. There's plenty of money in this country. 
there's, in, in terms of real development, there is no dirt of money. I think uh, the, the biggest problem is having a grand vision because you have, uh, you have a grand number of schemes uh, which uh, leak um, profusely and uh, will not get delivered uh, because they leak. They're designed to leak. And uh, the people, you know, it sounds strange, but the people don't really want handouts. They like to have handouts, but uh, after, after a while they find the patronizing. They may not express it in the way I'm expressing it, but they, uh, they will sort of shoot away. And I think the best example is the, 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 the MLA election in Rajasthan recently. I think it, was, it came after a huge amount of handouts and everybody thought those handouts are going to work. And there were enormous, you know, uh, emo, e enormously likable handouts. May not be in terms of world money, but it looks very nice on paper. Um, but the pe people just, you know, put it away. Um, because, it, you know, they, they want something tangible. And that tangible will come when you provide that social aspect of the leadership. Mm. And I think that is not happening because the, the process of uh, entry into politics and the process of getting elected and uh, the critical mass of politicians available uh, are not believing in a grand vision. But and I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying, I'm talking across the political spectrum. I'm not, I'm not blaming yeah. any political party or any state or any such thing. Yeah. But it, uh, say just your own experience of having contested the Lok Sabha seat in 2009, not won that election, won uh, assembly constituency in 2013, where you have a much more manageable size. Of our parliamentary constituencies are vast, right? So do you think in your own experience, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get you to think about specifics of your own constituency. You, if you have a vision, can you make it happen? Can you provide that social vision that you know your electorate want you to provide? Well, you can't. I think it's unfair to, uh, to provide it only for one constituency. Because you can only do it for yours. No, I, I mean, you, you're part of the process. Of, you know, if you're in Rajasthan, you're part of 25 MPs, and you're part of 200 MLAs. And if there's a good delivery system happening, or, or a good scheme happening in, in one district, it should be applicable to all districts. It shouldn't just be monopolized by one district. Sure. Because uh, the, you know, the stress on life is, the, is equal everywhere. Maybe in some districts it's more in terms of water, more in terms of roads. You know, the, there can be a variation in terms of the, the crisis, but every district has a has similar crisis. Um, so it's not just me or you know, somebody, some, MLA, some other MLA or some other MP delivering on the vision in that particular area. I think the, the challenge is to have that vision uh, accepted by a larger number of people in the political world and that be the benchmark on which governance happens. Um, that's where I use the word critical mass. I think that critical mass of politicians is not there. Hmm. Um, May I just Can, say something? Yeah, else? sure. You see, I, I think it's right that you know you, you can't just uh, make a, a dream in one small constituency. If you have a dream, it should be a magnum dream. You know, it should involve everybody, and that's possible. And people who are in politics today obviously are better positioned, but that doesn't absolve us of our responsibilities. I think for a long time, there are people like us who kept sort of self-flagellating, saying that we are so small, we are so educated, and we are so middle class, and we are so useless. I think that is wrong. It's because we are all these things that we are so useful to democracy. We can do things which we have so far stayed away from. And this is the responsibility when he said there are not enough politicians. I think politicians have got a bad name, but the idea of politics, of being able to make change, to be able to think big, I think is incumbent upon all of us. And that is how politicians are put under pressure, the professional politician, and they might then rise to the occasion. So I believe that the citizen elite is, is hiding in all of us.
see change. Good people have to be out there. And uh, change is possible. It sounds like Bhutan would make for a very good case study to test your uh, thesis on. And in fact, it, it sort of makes me think your examples don't really take in east of India, do they? I mean, the East Asian examples, and, uh, or even somebody like Aung San Suu Kyi, who you've gone on record to say you have great admiration for. Is she that kind of person? What, what, do we have similar Basque country-like stories in the East that you can cite to support your argument? You see, one of the reasons I didn't take the East is because I was afraid, and you might say I was being a bit of a chicken right in the, at, the, at that point. But I was, I was afraid that someone might say that all of this does well in the East because there are dictators around, which is why I didn't want to take that up very seriously. But the reason also is that even the most, uh, shall I say, vain dictator will have to admit that whatever he promises or, 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 or sort of, you know, proposes to his people are things that democracy has already achieved. Democracy has shown us the ultimate, shall we say, the best, not the ultimate, the best. And most people try to imitate that. And as, as I told you earlier, democracy is not easy, but democracy has been the best system so far in bringing out efficiency. Now, the East has things to teach us. I think, for example, the anti-corruption movement that you, can, you see in different parts of East Asia are very illust illustrative and educational, and we should learn from them. Even the Indonesian example mm. is, a, is a worthwhile one. We all talk about Singapore, but Indonesia has a pretty good model in place which we can learn from. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about democracy, we just don't talk about the movement element of ousting people, bringing in cleanliness. We're also thinking in terms of universal health and education so that the dreams of citizenship can be fulfilled because citizenship is hiding out there. It's a rhinestone in the muck. We have to pull it out you know, and polish it. And that is something that movements cannot accomplish on their own. They can set the stage, like our forefathers set the stage with independence. And now we must go further and get citizenship. And the irony of the situation, of course, is that I know from my own research, which looks at why people vote in elections. And India has some of the highest numbers of voter participation, especially in rural areas and amongst the lower strata of society. That the understanding of citizenship, and citizenship is a, is a word in English that we don't use in common language very easily in common conversation. Where is a number of uh, Indian languages, the word nagrik or nagorikta uh, or uh, urimai and kalamai, you know, rights and duties in Tamil. I mean, these are words that are used in, on an everyday basis by large parts of the electorate. Mm. So there, there is a real sense of citizenship. There is that idea that without participation at the very basic level, and in the context of elections, it's about turning up to vote. But it's also saying that, you know, turning up to vote is only the first stage of a greater degree of participation that is required to create change. So the irony, of course, is that the electorate seems to understand this. Yeah, but you have to open the doors, you see. You have to provide a vision, a horizon. Yes. And and you, as you said in your book, that you, know, you might uh, give them uh, rum and rupees, you know, but, but, you know, but that doesn't mean that they will vote for you. Yeah. Because they have a fair idea of why they're voting, who they're voting for. Just imagine if these people are voting for a dream what a big difference would make, instead of just voting for a person. Okay, so a final question before we open up for, for 10 minutes of Q&A, is do each of you think that the you know, citizen elites have to be individuals, or can political parties and governments, the state, provide the leadership that you define as the one associated with citizen elites? Really? Do they have to be individuals, or can governments be behave like citizen elites? I think uh, the system, the country can also create citizen elites, and I think government can also be citizen elites. Uh, um, I, I drew a lot of inspiration from the Georgian experience, uh, where in seven years, uh, the country was transformed forever. And I think, uh, Change always has to begin with a small group of people. And I think if these right people are there in governance, government can make a big difference as well. Thank you. Manvin. I certainly think gov uh, government and uh, the, the political class uh, can evolve uh, into a citizen elite. I, I don't think that's uh, uh, a big task. Uh, the problem lies in the collection of 
individuals, uh, you know, thrown into that club once in five years. And, uh, and that club membership is, Changing. you know, mm. that's a risk. Yeah, of course, you, you need uh, a critical number of people to make the difference. But it will always be a small number of people who will goad the rest into action. Yeah. It's never as if the majority is willing there, waiting there and willing to do things. You have to get them going. And as I said earlier, it is a very risky affair. And also, you can't predict in advance when they'll come together. But once they come together, the magic starts working and you can feel it in your bones. Okay, that's a good positive note to end on. I, I can imagine there are lots of questions from the floor. Before we start taking them, can I just urge you, A, to be brief, but also to warn you that if you're not brief, the microphone will be taken away from you. <laughs> so you do this at your peril, but our stewards are on, on strict instructions to do this. We'll start with the gentleman in the first row, please. Please be brief. Yeah, Professor Dipankar, you mentioned about uh, universal health, education, urbanization, etc., and we are talking about democracy. Fundamentally, what is the business of the government? Government is to save uh, uh, human lives and property and development. Why should the government should be? Uh, yesterday, I read that the government of Rajasthan is going to build houses and give on rent. Why should the government be in the building houses, giving on rent, hotel business, and all sorts of unnecessary things? They should be managing law and order and basic uh, infrastructure and fundamental things. More pri uh, kept, private people can do other businesses. Thank you. That's, that's my question. Thank you. Do you want to answer or does the <laughs> government of Rajasthan want to answer? <laughs> I'll just say this much very quickly. You mentioned development. And development is what we're talking about. If you want to make people into citizens, you have to give to them an equality of status of health and education, urbanization, living conditions, which no individual alone or no company or no capitalist group or no entrepreneur can actually do. For this, you need the government to put things in place. And after that, as I said to you earlier, once you confer an equality of status, upon that foundation, let there be structures of inequality. But that has to be provided. And then other things can happen. You cannot have a society where you do not have universal health and education. Do you know in our country, every year, 39 million people go into poverty because they cannot pay their medical bills. Do you know that 36% of the sick in our country don't even go to a doctor? because they don't have the money for it. 73% of all expenses are out of pocket in health. Now, these are tragic numbers which we should not allow to remain for too long. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Please be brief. You mentioned. Uh, the idea of vision that was touched upon by most of the speakers and the, uh, the troika of citizen elites of uh, politicians, bureaucrats, and, uh, and business people. Now, if you take the vision idea and the blame game between the three, do you think uh, we have a problem of intention in our country by politicians, bureaucrats, and business people that are, that are keeping our democracy fully unrealized and under-delivered to the people? Should we take a couple of questions? Yeah. Uh, okay, just here, just next to him on the, in the same row, yeah. My question for Manindar Singh, as a journalist and as a, a MP and as an MLA and also Colonel, uh, what is your vision for uh, young people and what is your vision uh, as a, um, in, in your constituency um, issue uh, in uh, health matter and in literature, education? What's your vision? Can I just say one thing before we, we take some more questions? Is that if you want to ask your question in Hindi, uh, I think we can all manage with Hindi except for Lili, who we won't, uh, uh, but I don't think we can manage Bengali, Dipankar, and I, but please use other languages if you need to uh, ask your questions. Should we take a couple more, Manvendra? Yeah. Because there are lots and lots of questions. I could answer this question. Okay. Ask them directly. Okay. Well, yeah, I think the, uh, what I would like the youth, I mean, those are specifically in terms of my constituency also, but, but it's, a, it's applicable everywhere. I think, I think where I would like the youth is to participate in the citizenship project which Professor Gupta is talking about. It's the, the binding together of the like-minded for a larger goal for the country. 
And good to start small. Okay, I'd be very happy if she started it. But the project is larger, it's a national project. And I think it'd be very happy if the youth of Shiv started it. Okay, there's a young man in the blue jumper there. Please. Hello, good evening, sir. Manvinder, sir. This is, like you just said, that India needs uh, need more professional people in politics. And India had recently experienced with Aam Aadmi Party. And Aam Aadmi Party are having many uh, they won the election. Many of these MLAs are banker, journalist, and etc., etc. But they are not able to deal the public issue effectively. What's your views on this? Who are you asking the question no. to? Yeah. Let's take a couple. Yeah, let's take a few more. Let's take yeah. a few more. There are lots of questions. Can you come up to the, towards the front, please? Or there's a yellow. Yeah. Uh, my question is to. Professor Dipankar Gupta, uh, the new phenomenon which came in New Delhi, uh, Delhi elections, in the name of Aam Aadmi Party. I want to ask a simple question, how we are going to define Aam Aadmi? Uh, Mr. Kejriwal says Aam Aadmi is from Jhuggi to Greater Kailas. Then where does the inequality go? Where does the hunger go? Where does the poverty go? And in the name of Aam Azmi Party, when Yogendra Yado says, he, this is a tent under which it, uh, every, every moment can come, then what about the Aam Azmi who are, who are fighting for their nationalities in Kashmir, who are fighting for their nationalities in Northeast, and who are fighting against the setting up of a nuclear plant in Kudan Kulam? Okay. They have okay. not. Um, they have never come with means their positions on all these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Just behind is one more question, and then and then we'll uh, have some answers. My question is to Madam Wang Chuk. I'm curious to know, particularly with reference to what you said about the idea of democracy being introduced by Your Majesty um, uh, to a, a populace which didn't necessarily want it or was uh, interested in it. Um, as if to instigate a more bottom-up, participatory kind of uh, governance, way of uh, uh, governing themselves. I'm curious about how, under this climate, the very notion or experience of citizenship might be evolving uh, in your country, in Lily, terms of entitlement, access, agency. Thank you. Lily, why don't you go first, and then we'll come back um, to the man. Yeah, democracy, the introduction of democracy in Bhutan has actually been a very gradual process. In the, it mostly began with decentralization in the 80s. And by 90s, there was more devolution of power. And it was only in the, uh, six years ago, when the 2008, when democracy, parliamentary democracy was introduced. And uh, His Majesty himself uh, uh, visited uh, people across the country. Uh, explaining people what democracy was all about and how people were encouraged to participate in the political process as citizens and as voters and also as uh, candidates in uh, various parties. So the, that effort was made right from top down and I think even uh, five, six years of our experience with democracy, uh, I think uh, yeah, even though uh, there has been a lot of uh, participation of people, I think we are still grappling with uh, other challenges because we still have a very fairly, uh, not a very literate society. So education is a big challenge. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The two questions, two, three questions around the Amadmi issue, do you, do you want to take them? I think one because that was specific to me in terms of, <clears throat> okay, uh, yes, the Amadmi party has attracted professionals, but I, I think the larger number of Amadmi party chaps who got elected or people who got elected uh, I would uh, definitely not uh, qualify as professionals. And uh, I think your question was also answered earlier by uh, Professor Gupta's point that the Ahmadi Party is, is essentially a movement. And that mo the transformation of the movement into a political party hasn't really happened. And it's a movement uh, in power. Uh, I think, for me, obviously, prematurely. And I think that's where the problems are because the delivery can only come when the, the person in power has an experience. And experience comes from you know, years of being in it. You can come in five years, you can come in 10 years, you can come in two years. 
but it takes a greater number of effort and time. Yeah, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the contemporary world, let's say from 2011 onwards, uh, one thing strikes you, uh, that would be how people in different parts of the world, whether it is the 99% in Wall Street, or we are the indignados in Latin America, or I am I'm, uh, Anna in, in India, very simple slogans which are almost graffiti-like, they have mobilized people. There's no great ideology at work. Just simple, straightforward, incisive statements that seem to make a big difference. Why is that so? I think that is because over the, over the years, a huge lot of muck has collected around democratic practices. And everywhere people are tired of that. They, they see the promise of democracy, they know democracy can deliver, but they find that the politicians who are at the helm of affairs are not doing their job, and they've had enough excuses. They've had enough ideologies. In the past, we had cleavages of various sorts that worked. Caste cleavage, class cleavage, language cleavage, religion cleavage, and polit political parties worked on these cleavages and established their territorial sovereignty in, 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 in respect of these cleavages. Today, with Ahmadmi Party, I am Anna, or we are the Ahmadmi, or we are the Indignados, or we are the 99%, all these political cleavages are being rubbished. And people are saying that we are citizens, listen to us. As citizens, we want certain things from the government. They are kind of citizens as consumers, you might say. And these citizens, consumers are saying, listen to us. I think this is the first stage rocket, as I was mentioning to you earlier. The second stage is the party formation. And perhaps it's a little unfair to expect the Ahmadi party to become a political party overnight in the true sense of the term. But it is fair to say the Ahmadi Party should watch every step because the nation is watching mm -hmm. and has to be very careful in how it goes about doing things. Okay. There's a young lady somewhere just behind the camera. Has she left? No? I was looking for some women to ask questions. Yeah, There's one there. Okay, I'll, the I'll come back to you. Uh, in the, the yellow, row. there's one in the first row and one the yellow jumper at the back. Lots of women's hands have gone up, which is fantastic. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the importance of education in terms of literacy and how one of the key roles of the citizen elite is to bring about universal education. But if we flip that on its head and ask what role does education have in creating elite citizen elites, how would we look at that? What role education has in creating and inculcating these values in students today? Because there's no question that school plays a big part in who becomes elite, but what is the role of school in inculcating values of citizen elites? Thank you. And there's one right in the front here. Hi, my question is to any one of the panelists. I want to sort of go back to Zuccotti Park in New York and talk about the Occupy Wall Street movement that took place. Can you go on the mic closer? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm referencing the Occupy Wall Street movement that took over New York. What exactly stopped it from metamorphizing into a political party? What exactly were the hurdles that it faced? Why did we not, you know, because it got a lot of media coverage in the beginning and it sort of died down. So what are the possible reasons behind why Aam Aadmi Party has sort of, you know, been able to be more successful electorally? Just a quick answer to that question. You might want to look at David Graeber's book called The Democracy Project, which is exactly about this. This is exactly what he writes about. But I'll let the panelists answer. Should we take a couple more since there's so many questions? Uh, this gentleman here. I'll be brief. Uh, Please be very brief. Mr. Nanander Singh, your argument that Am Party doesn't have experience to deliver our feeling is that they have started delivery. If you bring time, experience, and that speed of delivery into focus of Congress, Britishers, and Janta pa Bharti Janta Party, you will find that Aam Party has done much better Sir, do you than have a the question? two parties. Number I mean, one, number two. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to argue about your opinion. That's and your sir, opinion. Oh. Sir, I have gone to see. And you're you. saying that uh, every region is distressed. It's not true. Shiv or Barmer, 
is a highly distressed region than any district in Rajasthan. Thank I come sir. to my promised question to Professor Dipank Gupta. Mm. The whole discussion can be summarized into is wealth theft or all wealth is theft? Thank you. And the lady next to her and then we'll uh, next to her. Uh, so we've heard that Bhutan in Bhutan Munaki had introduced the idea of democracy uh, where the, uh, the, the king was, had the right to inherit it from his father. He had gone ahead and introduced the idea of democracy, whereas in India, we see a sort of reverse thing. We see that people elect and then, you know, a politician's son become politician. Uh, it happens in other professions, it happens in Bollywood, it happens in business. But do you think that the idea of nepotism in politics is hindering that citizenship to come alive in a bigger way? Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question because I'm one of the people you are referring to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the majority of people in politics in India don't come from political families. And I think if you, if you go by the statistics, uh, I think 27-28% uh, in parliament come from second or third generation families. Uh, rest is there. Probably the same in assemblies across the country. And the most crucially, uh, the most crucial elected office in India is that of a sarpanch. In Rajasthan it's called sarpanch, in some other state it's called something else. And in that office, I think the figure would be even higher of non transmitted uh, office. Uh, the lady mentioned uh, education, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, education is uh, an important subject and health because, uh, you know, we have come to a stage now in democracies all over the world where people are not really interested if politicians address their felt needs. It is felt aspirations that they want the politicians to attend to. And education is a huge felt aspiration. In 1980, about 2% of Indian kids went to private schools. Today, 21% in rural India and 51% in urban India go to private schools. And believe me, at least 60% of the cases, parents can hardly afford this. Mm. And this is very unfair. You don't have to make such sacrifices for your children, but they're forced to because they feel that there's a world out there beyond their mud walls and villages where the children should get to. And the children too believe in that. And this is a kind of aspiration that is there, but which cannot be addressed if you're thinking only of felt needs or the election that's down the corner. So felt aspiration and education go together. And once you train somebody in that fashion, who knows what they'll be? Remember that line from the elegy written in the country churchyard by Thomas Gray? Mm -hmm. For many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste his sweetness in the desert air. Who knows how many flowers are there that are born to blush and see, but would one day blush in full glory if education were provided. Mm. In terms of democracy again, you know, I think why didn't a party become a democracy? Why didn't, or why didn't 99% uh, take over power? The thing really is that you are, you have to admit the fact that democracy also means protests from outside. I remember when the Anna Hazare movement was going on, a large number of parliamentarians said, who are these people to tell us what to do? We are the elected few and we know what's best. But that's not right. Across the world, across time and space, democracy has been informed, I think very, very uh, correctly, by pressures from outside. Sometimes these pressures are, are absorbed and sometimes these pressures bounce back. To, to, to return again, this recursive move may happen, you never know. But, you know, democracy is always about pressures from outside and elites from within, and this combination is what makes things happen. We don't know, this 99% may not be dead. It may come again. There may be so many attempts made by different people across history in democracy who failed in the first round, came back in the second round, or failed forever, and somebody else picked up the threads two or three decades later. Okay, friends, I know many of you have questions and you haven't been, I haven't been able to invite you to ask your questions, but it allows me to remind you that 
This is the first of three sessions called Democracy Dialogues. So there'll be more scope for dialogue with the audience and with other panelists. So please come along to them. Two of them are scheduled tomorrow. So please come along. In the meanwhile, uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful three panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepankar Gupta, Manvendra Singh, Lili Wangchuk, for this very interesting.